Hi, Shri. Don't forget to unmute. Hi, Nawal. Thanks. I wanted to get your perspective on pseudonymy and accountability. I, I think there is there is probably a compelling rationale for it in the socio-political space. But when you're talking about financial implications, financial models, especially in Web3, how do pseudonymy and accountability really come together? Is, is it a model that's really sustainable going forward? Thanks. Yeah, so the question is about accountability and pseudonymity in Web3 and how they intersect. I, I do think you generally have to have a high level of accountability to get properly, quote unquote, paid. Because if it's not associated with you, then people will steal credit. You'll have a hard time having good branding. You'll have a hard time getting leverage. But things are changing. In the olden days, being 20, 30 years ago, if you wanted a personal brand, you were talking about spending a lot of money in marketing. You were talking about having t-shirts, maybe like your name on a tower, maybe going on TV, maybe going on radio, maybe showing up in the media. So there was no concept of pseudonymity. And pseudonymity is this halfway ground between anonymity and nomity, which is being named. It's a new phenomenon that only really exists on the internet, where you can build up a reputation and a track record, but you can put it behind a .eth domain name, or you can put it behind a board ape or a crypto punk uh, profile picture avatar, and you can do your work completely online. So I think this is a very interesting model. It's a good defense against cancel culture. It's a good defense against all kinds of things. It puts people on even footing, whether you're male or female or black or brown or white or what have you or old or young. So I do think it's, it is very powerful, but I think it's emergent. And I think the pseudonymity only applies within the narrow Web3 domain. So if you're in Web3 and you have a reason for the pseudonymity, then I think it's a very powerful weapon. And by all means, you should use it. I think it's as good as accountability. It's just not the accountability is accruing to your avatar instead of to you personally. I, I think it's a fantastic new model. If I were starting out today, I would probably have a pseudonymous avatar. Maybe not, because I like talking too. And it's hard to make a voice pseudonymous or to be voice un anonymous, but I, I would probably have less of, of a revealed identity out there. That said, I think outside of Web3, it doesn't really apply and it may never apply. But then again, I think Web3 is going to be a very big part of society and the economy going forward. So more and more people will be pseudonymous. One other point is there is a place where pseudonymity is quite prevalent outside of Web3, and that's on Twitter. On Twitter, you have all these Anon accounts. And there are occasionally people who call for banning Anon accounts. And I think that's a big problem. Uh, of course, the worst of accounts are Anon. The, the trolls and like the real haters and the automated accounts and the spam accounts are largely anonymous. But I think the best accounts are also anonymous because they can speak truth at a level where named accounts can't. Because there is a collective set of lies that we have to believe as society to get along. And that set of lies is always shifting within the Overton. And there's a small Overton window that's always moving around. And if you say the wrong thing, you can get canceled, you can get attacked, you can get ostracized, or you can get just shamed or humiliated. But they're saying true things. And what's even worse now is that cancel culture will reach back to your tweets 10 years ago and cancel you over that. So I just think it constrains the discourse if we only have named accounts. It constrains it unacceptably because now those people can be punished. So for the same reason, the secret ballot isn't very important. And the gnome de plume with the, the pen name writing, I think like Ben Franklin used to write under gnome de plumes, for example, and m several of the founding fathers of the United States did. I, I think it's a very powerful thing and I encourage it. I do think there should be more Anon accounts, not less. It's very easy to block or mute annoying Anon accounts. In exchange, you get incredible truth speaking from some very high quality accounts. I think if Twitter were ever to do away with Anon accounts, it would essentially be a much less interesting platform, even to the point where it might get displaced by a platform that embraced Anons. I'm not 100% sure about Facebook because I deleted my Facebook account a long time ago, not out of any prejudice, but just because I found it more annoying than anything else. I believe Facebook does not allow Anon accounts. And that right there makes Facebook way less interesting as a medium where you're going to learn anything or encounter anything truly interesting or off the beaten path. Aniket, the Reading Habits guy. Aniket, you're on the air. So we have heard you talk so much about reading and reading books. And with us moving into this entirely digital generation where people are not reading books. How do you see people reading in the generation or years to come by? And where do you see books going and the authors going from here onwards? Yeah, I obviously grew up reading a lot of books and I love books. Doesn't mean books are the only medium of learning. Some people learn from YouTube videos. Some people like audiobooks. Some people like tweets. Some people like blog posts. At the end of the day, it's about where you can find the highest signal to noise ratio. 
Books are uniquely interesting for a number of reasons. One is unlike the synchronous media of YouTube and audiobooks, uh, you can consume books asynchronously, which means that on one sentence you can spend an hour and then the next paragraph you can spend a minute and the next chapter you can spend a second as you slip through it. So for anyone who's serious about absorbing knowledge, books are a much better medium. They're much more efficient. And the point of reading is not to stack up a giant stack pile of books that you then tweet out and say current reading this week uh, look at how many books i read thumping your chest and and the point of reading is not even to necessarily absorb knowledge in an age of google the the knowledge is always a fingertip away but the, the point of reading is to spark your own creativity and to spark your own thoughts so it's almost like you're starting a fire in your brain so a really good book has to be read slowly if you're reading books quickly and you're proud of the speed at which you're reading them you're reading the wrong books it's like lifting weights that are way too light you're just cranking through the exercise uh, on the other hand if you read a book that's way too difficult for you and you're just stuck and can't make any progress then that's like trying to lift a weight that's too heavy you can't even get a single rep off but what you want is you want to lift a weight or read a book that is kind of at the edge of your ability, where you're learning more, but it's a struggle. It's it's a little painful. It's a little confusing. But at the same time, it's sparking ideas and thoughts that then you have to add your own creativity and your own interpretations and apply to your own experiences to learn something. The books that excite me the most are the ones that make me smarter. They don't necessarily give me more knowledge or information. I'm not going to necessarily read a book on why water is the most important molecule in the world or a biography of a famous general. But those books are always a fingertip away. I can pull them up and you know read them very quickly and easily if I need to or want to. But I, I'm not going to just absorb useless knowledge that I can just Google on demand. Rather, the books that I read are the ones that make me smarter. In fact, Brett Hall just joined the chat. And Brett is a a teacher of physics and epistemology and runs this great podcast called The Theory of Knowledge Podcast, which I've shilled before on my Twitter. It's actually probably the only podcast that I listen to religiously because it makes me smarter and because Brett is exploring this book called The Beginning of Infinity, which also is probably the best book I've read in the last decade and also made me a lot smarter. I wish I'd encountered it earlier. But that's not to say that reading that book is the end all and be all. And there's nothing magical about the book format. In fact, I don't think Deutsch, you know, no offense to him, he's a brilliant thing. I don't think he's the best writer because I think he's writing for other physicists. And so he's not writing for you and me. Uh, Or maybe if he tries, but it's hard for him to operate down at our lowly levels. So people like Brett and myself and others can help interpret it as we chew on it. We can digest it and pass it down. And there's a few chapters in the beginning of infinity that are the most interesting and applicable for normal people. And I encourage everyone to go and digest those. And it took me to really get through the beginning of infinity and the fabric of reality, which is the precursor to the beginning of infinity. It took me about two years to get through it. And it's not to say it took me two years to read it. I'm a very fast reader. I, I probably can and, and did at some point read both books in you know a weekend. But it took me two years to actually understand the concepts in the book. And there are single paragraphs in there, which sent me down rabbit holes of videos and podcasts and and reading and looking at papers and opening up a physics textbook and so on that consumed two months at a time. There was some comment about multiverse and the Schrodinger wave equation that had me in a tizzy for quite a while. And it's not to say that I still understand all of the beginning of infinity, but I understand enough of the concepts that now I've integrated into my core philosophy of decision-making and judgment. So I I don't think books are necessarily a sacred medium, but I think they're an important medium besides just asynchronous consumption. Another important one is that a lot of the best work that has been written, especially if you're talking about philosophy or something that's not that modern, remember the old questions have old answers, those were written a long time ago. And a lot of the things that they wrote down back then would be socially or politically incorrect to write today. Many writers are only famous after their own time simply because their peers have to die out and stop condemning them for a new generation to come in and absorb whatever they wrote objectively rather than through the lens of this can't be right because my current society is not ready to absorb this truth. So I do recommend reading a lot of old books because I think for philosophy and wisdom, most of it has been said better before. You can always rephrase it in a new way, maybe apply it to a brand new thing that showed up, but the timeless questions have timeless answers. Another advantage of reading it through a book rather than watching it through a video is the author is a, a little more invisible to you. And that's good because that removes your ego from the equation. It's not like your friend next door telling you something. There's the old line, no man is a prophet in his own land. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I see this in my own social circles where I literally sit around with 20 people who are talking, let's say, about crypto or wealth creation. And I know what they're saying is wrong, but they're not going to ask me because I'm their friend. They've already kind of 
stuck me into the friend bucket. So we're peers. They're not going to look up to me in that regard, or I may not look up to them in their areas of expertise. So if you can remove the speaker from the spoken, if you can remove the writer from the writing, then it allows you to absorb it with less in the way. It allows you to make it your own and, and then regurgitate it later, but again, through your own lens in such a way that it becomes a part of the fabric of your thoughts. And so I do think that uh, absorbing knowledge from a book, I find it to be higher quality absorption than if it's coming through a speaker. Maybe that's just me. There are some extremely good blogs out there. Unfortunately, due to cancel culture and just the decline of blogging in general, a lot of them have been disappearing off the internet. But I do think that some of the best content and writing that I've ever encountered was in a long-form blog post floating around the internet. But that's a hard problem to dig through now. Google doesn't do a very good job of surfacing blog results. There was a time when they used to prioritize blog results much more highly than search. These days, if you search for anything on Google, you're just going to get a list of 100 different official sources, which just kind of shows you that the manual tweaking of Google has been taken over by the usual trust and safety teams. So if you're going to find these good blogs, it's going to be through personal recommendations or social media, again, kind of the dark corners of social media. So again, nothing magic about books, but Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett say that everybody that they know who's smart is an avid reader. And I have a hard time refuting that. I have yet to meet someone who I'd consider at a very high functioning level of intelligence who doesn't read for fun. Underline those last two words, for fun. And which is not to say that you should go and make it a chore to start reading. But one of the tweets I'm proudest of is, is read what you love until you love to read. So the, the goal here is not to go crack a physics textbook immediately, but just develop a, a love for reading if you can, better done at an early age, like everything else. And if you can develop a love for reading, then eventually you'll navigate your way to the things you're quote unquote supposed to read just because you get bored of the trite stuff. A lot of the same points, same jokes, same observations will strike you as pedestrian. And there is a certain magic to quantity, right? Once you get through enough books, you just become a better reader. It's like anything else. That said, the goal here is not to read the largest quantity of books, it's to read the highest quality of books. I will once again plug the beginning of, of Infinity and I'll say, read it and spend two years on it if you have to and listen to Brad's podcast because if you can get through the beginning of infinity and really understand the core principles at a deep level it's going to improve the quality of your thinking so much that your future books and blog posts and tweets that you pick up you will be able to determine very quickly which ones are talking truth and which ones are talking trash and I mean, believe me your theory of knowledge right now is not good enough whatever you think it is you can upgrade it as we we're talking about before judgment is the most important thing hey brett Brett, you got a special dispensation. I'm not going to bounce you after a question. We can just talk for a bit. Or maybe I'll let you talk for a bit. Ah, there we go. Yeah, people want to know stuff, don't they? And so if you have a scattergun approach to the way in which you approach books, then you might be going for breadth rather than depth. And the thing about depth is that depth has inherent breadth. It has breadth because the deeper the ideas, the more different subjects those ideas are going to touch. And so this is why we're drawn to something like the beginning of infinity and to the work of David Deutsch generally, because he has devoted his life to drilling down to find the most foundational principles across physics, epistemology, mathematics. And so once you get down there to that level of depth, you really are talking about all the ways in which knowledge is created in every other subject and the limitations that the physics actually places upon our ability as human beings to construct knowledge. So once you've got those fundamental ideas, you've got a really interesting way of critiquing all the other ideas that are out there. And so that's why we're so uh, thrilled with The Beginning of Infinity, because it's one of the most profound books with respect to depth of ideas.